Uh, come on, Grantsville. Does anybody love Jesus in this place tonight? Can we give it a praise? Grace, what you guys need to know at the end of that song, uh, the Two Minute Mingle, we actually just joined all of our campuses in Georgia, all across the state of Alabama. And I don't know if you guys know that we do this. I'm normally at a campus. Anytime Pastor Chris says, hey, Grace, you want to welcome all the campuses, we all clap too, like you guys can hear us, even though you can't. <laughs> hey, church family, let's say hello to one another right now. Come on, put your hands together. <laughs> campuses, we are so glad that you're here. Hey, if I've not had the chance to meet you, my name is Matt, and, uh, and I serve on the team here at Highlands. I serve right now as the Grandview Campus Pastor, everybody. <laughs> Love you, Grandview. You guys should be at Grandview right now. Um, so, 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 I, I love our church, but on the team now, uh, we're going into our 13th year on staff, which is crazy to think about. Um, and I did not start as a campus pastor. I started on the creative team. I was creative team and also production team. I, I don't, I've always wanted to do this because I remember I sat in, in that, that banker booth from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire up there for like, for like four years. Um, at every campus, can you honor your production team right now? Can we just put your hands together? We love you guys so much. This was on the creative team. Um, I, I, I did a thing one time where I put on a bee costume. I don't know if you guys ever remember that at all. Um, if, you're new, if you're new to our church, we'll, we'll get that to you. I think that's the moment Pastor Chris said, I think you need to be a campus pastor. I think that, that's the moment when it happened right there. Um, no, I, I love our church so much, and um, I, I want to honor Pastor Chris. Uh, he he and, uh, and Ms. Tammy send their love. They're going to be back with us on Sunday. We had the best time. I actually got to sit by PC uh, the entire conference at Motion Conference. And I'm gonna tell you what I love about our pastor. So many things, because I can spend 35 minutes talking about uh, how much I love PC. Um, but he and Miss Tammy had their phones out during Motion Conference and grow like a mom and dad at a soccer game. It was the craziest thing, snapping pictures, capturing all the moments. And what it, what it told me was that we have a pastor who has not lost the wonder of what we get to be a part of. Can we just honor Pastor Chris and Miss Tammy right now? Love you so much, love you PC. Love you so much, but I want to honor you guys. My, my family, I'm looking at my wife's down here, and my wife Heather, and our four kids. Um, we have 16-year-old, 14-year-old, 11-year-old, and a 9-year-old. That tells you how you can pray. <laughs> right there, you guys can pray for that. Uh, but our entire family, I know you guys feel this way too, our entire family would look different if it were not for this house, this church, this place. And, and I don't want us to ever take it for granted what we get to be a part of. I think when you, when you roll through a serve day, we're like, hey, we did it again. We put on red shirts. And thousands of us went out and served all of our communities. Kind of like, yeah, it was serve day. It's just, it's just what we do. We do a Grow Leader Conference. And 3,700 pastors from literally around the world try to get into our house to learn how they can do better, things better in their house. It's easy just to go, hey, man, that was just an event. Or Motion Conference. We're 13,000 students. 13,000 students packed into the Legacy Arena. Um, what I love is that about half of those students were Church of the Highlands students. Those were our students in that room at every campus. And I, I wanna share a number with you. And this is the number of students that met Jesus. But I mean, I'm telling you that there's, there's a danger that we'll start just hearing numbers and going, oh yeah, it was motion conference, we did that. And I think we need to carry Pastor Chris and Ms. Tammy's heart of like, oh no, 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 this is significant. This is special. Like, what, what, do we get, what do we get to be a part of? It's special. At Motion Conference, we had 1,211 students say yes to Jesus. Come on, can we give God praise for that? Come on, let me tell this. Amazing. So great. And I want to say thank you so much to the Dream Team. So many of you served, um, man, the entire month of July, Summer Blast, Serve Day, all the things that we did. Um, I actually got an email from a pastor who attended the Grow Leader Conference at Grandview. And his response to us, the feedback he gave us was the thing that he was most blown away by. And I don't want to hurt Pastor Chris's feelings at all, but um, it was the Dream Team. PC would even say that. It was the dream team. Uh, the, way, the way that you serve, the way that you give, the way people take vacation days to serve at a, at a pastor's conference and at a student conference. Um, I love the dream team so much. I wanna talk tonight about, about families. And I know when I say the word family, um, that's a loaded word. I mean, just, it just right now, when, you, when I say family, hang on to it, don't share it. But what comes to mind right now? For some of us, it's, um, it's like, man, this is a great thing, great memories. For some of us, when you say family, there's a, oh, that. And we even say family a lot around here at Highlands. I'll, I'll greet the Grandview campus and say, hey, what's up Grandview family? Um, but I want you to know that we do that on purpose. I wanna say this before we start anything else. Uh, God loves putting people in families. 
Like God loves it. He, he loves putting people in a house, this togetherness. And if God loves anything, you can rest assured that Satan hates that exact same thing. So if God loves families, Satan hates families. I wanna share a piece of scripture with you. It's gonna be in Psalm 68, and we'll have it on the screen. It says this, uh, sing to God, sing in praise of his name, extol him, we need to extol some more. I just, I just love that word, extol. Extol him who rides on the clouds, rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. And listen to this, this is for somebody in the room tonight. He's a father to the fatherless. God's a defender of the widows. The defender of the widows is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely. And that word lonely, I looked it up in the Hebrew. It means anytime you feel like you're the only one, which is always Satan's plan. Every time Satan talks to us, he says, you're the only one that's dealt with this. You're the only one that feels this. No one understands you. They don't get you. Every single time, that's the enemy's plan. Separate you, get you away from the house, get you away from the family where he can still kill and destroy. That's always his plan. But so God says, God says he wants the lonely. He wants to put them in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. Love this in Ephesians 2. Uh, this is from the message paraphrase. It says this. This is, this is an identity moment for us in this message. It says, hey, Church of the Highlands, you're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. It's why we put welcome home on the screen on Sunday mornings when people walk in. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here. Look at your neighbor at every campus and say, you belong here. Right now, go for it. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. He's using all of us, irrespective of how we got here and what he's building. He used the apostles and the prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all of the parts together, uh, we seek in it taking shape. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. I wanna talk tonight about how you can find treasure in this house, how to find treasure in this house. Uh, and our key text is gonna be a verse from Proverbs, Proverbs 15, six, that says, in the house of the righteous, there's great treasure. There's great treasure. And I don't know if you love pirate movies. I love pirate movies. If you start to, I, I love the Discovery Channel show where they're all mining for gold. We're still looking for treasure all the time. I kind of want to quit and go do that. We're, we're going to the mountains. We're looking for gold. Would you, would you agree with me that treasure is a really, really good thing? Right, everybody? Treasure is a great thing. So we, we have a, a relatively large family, six of us in our family. Um, and some of the people in my family love the beach. Where are the people, uh, you love the beach? Be beach lovers? Okay, in my mind, there's a dermatologist at every campus going, okay, I got you. Talk to you later, it's gonna be great. Um, no, I, so certain parts of my family, members of my family love the beach. Uh, I have a love-hate relationship with the beach. I, no matter how hard you try, sand will get in your bed. I don't understand this at all. You could take seven showers, there's gonna be sand in your bed. Um, I, I can't take it. It, it. Like right now, it's just like, no, I can't take it. Um, but when we were, we were uh, a, a newer family, younger kids, I think four young kids, uh, the beach, I had to work out to get in shape for the beach trip. Like I had to go, and it wasn't for a beach body. It's because if you're a dad and you've got young kids, when you go to the beach, you're a Sherpa. That's all you do, you carry stuff. <laughs> I don't know why we had so much stuff. I would, I would like train in my driveway, like carrying all right, beach chairs, beach chairs. We get, we're, get, we're getting ready for the beach. Um, and I remember going to the beach and, and, and kind of taking all of our stuff, man, six beach chairs, uh, several kinds of canopies, several kinds of, uh, like we, we wanna enjoy these outdoors, but not too much. Let's get a lot of canopies, uh, lots of bags, coolers, and, and Heather's got the kids. I, I've got the stuff. We had a wagon that did not roll in sand. Uh, uh, Amazon, Amazon lied to me on that one. So I have all this gear. And you know, when you go to um, most beaches, you have to get there, you have to claim your spot. You, you can't just, come on, you guys know this, you can't just wake up at 10.30 and be like, we're going to the beach now. That's not how it works anymore. Um, space is a premium on the beach. Unless you wanna be within earshot of somebody else's Bluetooth speaker, you have to get there <laughs> early enough and get your spot. And so I, I had uh, all our stuff, I'm going down to the beach. Heather's getting the kids ready. Nobody else on the beach. It's, it's that morning, still misty. And I'm like, man, I made it. I'm the only one. 
And I look on the beach and just down the way, I, I see this, I couldn't tell what was going on. It was one man by himself. And there was just, there was a lot of, there was, there was an apparatus. There was, there was a lot of, it was like cables and headphones. And he had this, this, this thing. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know if there was a, maybe somebody had left a mine there from a war that I didn't know about. Um, and he's just walking around and just, deep, 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 deep. So he walks up, I'm like, hey, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, for metal things, he's got a metal detector um, for the people it left on the beach. And I thought, what a dork. <laughs> this is, like, who would ever do that on vacation? Um, and so we, we do our beach day, kids go back to the beach, or go, go back to the, the, the place we're staying at and, and I'm packing everything up and the beach is kind of ending and uh, Mr. Metal Detector comes back out again. And so as I move our chairs, I literally, I, I pack our chairs up, I pack our stuff up, I back off, I'm kind of packing, you know, our whole caravan. We need camels to get all that stuff off the beach, packing our caravan up. We, I think we lasted two hours. It was not, it was not that long. <laughs> packing everything up and he comes right over to our spot, right where we were and walks up and he's doing his thing and it's right where we were sitting. And he digs and he finds a watch. And I was like, hold up a second. <laughs> Technically, that's our spot. <laughs> All day, we've been sitting on this watch. It was a good looking watch. Like, I don't know watch brands, names. It was shiny, it probably was expensive. Um, and I said, man, that's crazy. We were sitting on that the entire day. Um, I never knew it was there. And he said, well, it's probably because you weren't looking for it. And I think that we walk into church sometimes and we sit on the beach of Christianity. We say, man, we're here. But God's saying, yeah, but if you would just look for some stuff, there's some more treasure that you don't even have yet. There, there's more treasure that you can access. So I, I wanna talk about that. The Bible uses a couple different words to describe families. Um, one word is house. Anytime you read in the Old Testament where it says that the, that, that the house of David was blessed, uh, that wasn't a, a literal bi building, that was a group of people. Uh, in the New Testament, you guys remember the story? Come on, go back to, uh, anybody grew up Baptist in this room? Great, seven of you, also. Okay, so, um, so felt board, you guys remember felt board, everybody? So Sunday school class, um, Paul and Silas in prison. Uh, earthquake happens. You guys remember this? Earthquake happens. The chains fall off. Guard gets panicked because he's afraid somebody's going to walk in and say, you had one job. Like, like that. And he's like, I'm, I'm going to kill myself. And, um, and Paul and Silas say, no, 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 don't do that. He says, what do I need to do to be saved? So they lead him to Christ. And then Paul and Silas say to him, um, because you know, Jesus, you and your entire house will be saved. It wasn't talking about a building. It was talking about a people. So Proverbs 15, 6 tells us there's treasure in this house. So at every campus in Silicago right now, there's treasure in that house. Huntsville, there's treasure in that house. Maybe you're sitting right on top of it and you don't even know that it's there. And so I want us to dig in the sand a little bit. I want us to work and look for some treasure, especially going into the season that we're going in. Um, I went back, uh, this is crazy admission in front of all of you. I went back in preparation for First Wednesday and I watched every single First Wednesday that we've had this year just because I, I felt like there was a tone. There's been this, there's been this rhythm, there's been this song, there's been this um, continuity and what the Holy Spirit's been telling everybody that comes in the first Wednesday. And we started off the month of January with Pastor Chris saying, Lord, send revival. And we started off with this prayer of God, send revival to us. And we've seen miracles happen at first Wednesday. We've seen families restored. We've seen bodies literally healed at first Wednesday services. We're praying for them. And again, I don't want it to be one of these things like, well, that's first Wednesday. Hey, we're at the beach again. Can we all spiritually detect what the Lord is doing? Like lean in and find the treasure. First treasure I want us to look for tonight, I think we can find it, is the treasure of identity. The treasure of identity. Um, I'm gonna read you a passage of scripture. I think, um, in, in my estimation, it could be one of the saddest passages of scriptures in the, in the entire Bible. And so I'm gonna paint the scene a little bit. Um, Moses has been leading the children of Israel. They've been marching around the desert in the wilderness for 40 years. He hands things off to Joshua. Um, Joshua leads the people of Israel into the promised land. They cross the Jordan, they get into the promised land. And the Bible tells us that Joshua died when he was 110 years old. And so here, here's what we know. Uh, this verse is written 
um, is talking about, about, they've been in the promised land for about 30 years. So imagine this, here's, here's what the Bible says. It says this, um, after Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had, been, who had, had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Harris in the, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaish. And here, here, here's, the, here's the verse. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. 30 years. And as a parent, this, this like, it shakes me. If you have kids, imagine 30 years after you're gone, your kids and grandkids know nothing of what the Lord did for you. It's a crazy thing. They knew nothing of the parting of the Red Sea. Think about this, the plagues. They knew nothing of, of uh, God's law being written on tablets. They knew nothing of a burning bush. They knew nothing of the defeat of Jericho. Or maybe they knew it, but it was just history to them. And I think if we're, it, we sit in what we sit in too long, if we're just on the beach of following Jesus, um, we, we will resort to a, a, a religious historical affiliation instead of an everyday, no, I need God in my life kind of relationship with the Lord. We went from, hey, then here's the deal. The prophets did not stop prophesying. They still had summer blasts. Let me say it that way. They still had motion conference. They still had their festivals. The priests were still doing all the priestly duties. You know what stopped? The conversations outside of their gathering stopped. They stopped talking about who God was to them. They talked about the festival and the gathering and the event. They no longer talked about, oh man, our God is the God who'll provide manna tomorrow. Like, I don't know what it's gonna look like, but it's gonna be there. It'll be on the ground. Our God will provide for us. And I don't want us to get our identity. I have to be careful with this too, because I'm in this with you. I don't want us to get our identity wrapped up in what we do instead of who we serve. Y'all, our identity is wrapped up that we are, we are followers of the most high God. He's good. Can I get an amen from anybody in the house today? Do we need our, it's a treasure. There's treasure in the identity of being a follower of God. And I want us to hang on to that. The next treasure that we can find, if we really look, is the treasure of worship. Um, in every family, uh, we have to make sure that we're worshiping the right things all the time. Uh, I love this verse, Proverbs 14, 26. It says this, reverence. I wanna stop right there. I don't think we use that word enough anymore. Reverence for the Lord gives a man deep strength. His children have a place of refuge and security. That's a generational verse. Um, next verse I wanna give you is, is 2 Timothy 2, 22. Uh, and it says this, flee the evil desires of the youth. And you're like, Matt, that's not a worship verse. That's like, we should have read that at Motion Conference. That, that's for Motion Midweek. Um, some of y'all hadn't had trouble with the desires in a long time. You know, you know what I'm saying? But I don't think that we sell that verse short. It's not talking about, hey, this is just about students. I think it's Paul reminding us that at every stage of our life, there's gonna be a unique temptation at that stage of life. So for kids, there's a unique temptation. For, for our, our teens, I mean, the Bible's saying, hey, flee the desires of your youth. Um, hey, mom and dad, parents, what, what's the temptation you have right now? Uh, if, you're, if you're near um, empty nest um, stage of life, which I, I don't even know what that's like. That's gonna be amazing thinking about that. Uh, what's, what's the unique temptation that you have? Maybe it's retirement. There's a unique temptation in every single one, the season of life that we're in. If you're single, there's a unique temptation there. But how we view it, how, let me say this, how you view things will impact how you do things. What you're looking for, um, how, how you see that unique temptation will impact how you see God working in that situation. Um, I, I, I wanna confess as a, uh, as, as a dad that um, even as a pastor, that just like all of you, I, I know you have sin issues. Let me just say it that way. Like, I, I know you deal with sin because I do too. Every single one of us do. And the enemy hates it when we're completely focused, when there's a reverence for the Lord. He can't stand it. And so he'll use anything he can. You guys know this, anything, not just bad stuff, not just horrible stuff. He'll even use good stuff to get us out of, the, out of this, this spirit of reverence and being with God. 
Um, and I, I wanna confess some of the stuff that I've had to deal with. Uh, the, the Old Testament word for this, when you get your, your, your mind and your thoughts and your attention, your resources, your energy, when you get that off of God and put it on something else, you're not gonna like the word, but it's idolatry. That's what it's called. So anytime we go from like, God, you're great. God, we, we were singing this at Grand Smell. God, you're so good. Great are you, Lord. And we get into, and y'all, I can get sidetracked by the dumbest things. I'm an over-researcher. How many, any over-researchers in the room? So if it's a vacation, I'm researching for months. I, I, can, I, w- I would be ashamed to tell you how much time I've invested researching uh, reviews on Amazon over a $70 inflatable paddleboard. I'm, I'm telling you. <laughs> The simplest things can get us out of this mode of going, no, God, it's only about you. God, this is, this is only about you. Um, here, here's some of the idols that I've had to look out for in my own life, uh, especially with teens. Remember, we have teenagers at home. This may not be yours, but this is where we are right now. It says this, um, I, I, I wrote down the idol of comfort. There are some Sundays that I come home from church and, and doing the work of Jesus. Come on, somebody. Like, like, come on, meeting and greeting inspiring, helping people next step, take next steps and get home and have this, like this man, this expectation that my house is gonna look like a resort today. <laughs> I'm gonna walk in because I've done the work of the Lord and it's gonna be quiet. It's gonna be easy. Heather's gonna walk up with a, a, a nice beverage, <laughs> which is not happening, especially now. Um, <laughs> Usually when I come over to church, there are 15 kids in my front yard. Uh, my prayer request right now, I just want nice grass. That's all, that's all I want. I want nice grass. Uh, somebody in another season of life told me, hey, don't worry about the grass right now. Wait, wait till the kids leave. You can worry about the grass. Um, the idol of respect. Because if you're looking for it too much, it's no longer a desire. Now it's an idol. It's, you're expecting it to give you something, to feed you something. I think for parents, I think, you know, maybe for for moms, especially the idol of appreciation. When will someone appreciate what I'm doing? Uh, The idol of success, guilty of that as well. I I have been the dad at an eight-year-old's baseball game that that stands up and says things to the officiating uh, professionals. (laughs) Because if my kid can just succeed this one time, surely he will go pro. Like this, is, this, is, this is the way it works. And then usually someone in the bleachers will say, hey, Pastor Matt. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. Um, the idol of success. Um, what about um, the idol of control? If I can just control the situation, when we were never meant to be in control, God was always me- meant to be in control and everything. Well, the Israelites, they would go to, uh, to the prophets and they would actually ask, ask God to, to fix stuff. And I know we can do this. And we, we say, hey, God, I want you to fix this and fix this and fix this. And Ezekiel says this, um, Ezekiel 14, four, therefore speak to them and tell them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Uh, when any of the Israelites set up idols in their hearts and put a wicked stumbling block before their faces and then go to a prophet, they have prayer requests. Um, I, the Lord, will answer them myself in keeping with their great idolatry. And what I think that said, I, I always, anytime I read the, the word and I imagine God speaking to us, it is always out of kindness. Our God is a good, 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 good father. He's a great heavenly father. But I think when I pray to him, and especially with my kids, and I go, God, fix the bad and keep the evil away, uh, which as parents, I mean, a lot of times that's our prayer request. Fix the bad, keep the evil away, I think sometimes God's like, hey, Matt, yeah, I mean, I want to. And I understand what you're saying. But, but you, you've let the control of the situation become bigger than me. Like, would you just invite me to be biggest in the situation again? And that's why when we come together in moments like this, um, God knew that we would have, have issues with this. Um, we come together and we worship. We go all after it. We're not, we're, we're not just, it's not just 15 minutes, three and a half songs, a ministry moment. No, this is our chance to go, you know what? I'm gonna make God the biggest thing in my life all over again. How you view things will impact how you do things. Your quiet time. If it's just, I got up and I did, Pastor Blake talked about the one-year Bible. Incredible resource. I love the one-year Bible. But if we get up and and the way we view one-year Bible is I just need to say that I did the one-year Bible on the app, doing it. Um, 
that impacts how you do it. If you view it as, you know what, this is my chance all over again to make God the biggest thing in my life all over again and say, God, speak to me, point out the places, show me where I need to change. We can have this, 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 this treasure of worship in our lives all the time. The way you keep that is we have to stay in his presence. We have to fight to stay uh, in his presence. Uh, the, the third treasure that I wanna give you, so we've got the treasure of identity. Everybody say identity. The treasure of worship, say worship. The third is the treasure of, of mercy and grace. I love these treasures. I love these treasures so much. Uh, the Bible says in Psalm 150, 145, eight, uh, the Lord is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. First Peter 4, eight says this, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. I wanna explain the difference between mercy and grace really quickly, just for you note takers. Grant Mill is crushing it taking notes. I wanna say that by the way, uh, you're doing great. And these are all on the app. So if you wanna get the notes on the app, they're, they're all there. Mercy is undeserved forgiveness and unearned kindness. Mercy is undeserved forgiveness and unearned kindness. Grace is unearned gifts and favor. Another way of saying that is mercy is not getting what you deserved. Grace is getting way more than you did deserve. Does that make sense? Um, can I tell you where I'm praying the most right now as a dad? is that the thing that would reign supreme in my house is this treasure of mercy and grace. You know, sometimes I've, I've asked my kids before and say, uh, hey, what do, you, what do you think I care about the most? Which is a dangerous question. It's a great question. It's a dangerous question. Hey, what do you think I care about the most? And they're like, uh, towels on the bathroom floor? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, you know, serious stuff. Like, you know, go a little deeper. What, what do you think I care about the most? Um, me being on my phone too much? And it breaks my heart. Because I realize that's the thing I've been talking about the most. What I really want them to say is, Dad, you really love Jesus? and you love us the way that he loves you. That's the goal. There's a verse that says, um, I don't know if you remember how you got to repentance. I think it's a, a great exercise to go back through uh, how you came to this, this saving knowledge of Jesus. Do you guys remember how, what, what it was that got you to repentance? It was God's kindness. Isn't that crazy? It wasn't his rules. It wasn't expectations. Um, it wasn't pressure. It was just the kindness of the Father that led us to repentance. And I think that if we can get the treasure of mercy and grace, like dig it up. It's here, but you know the difference between when you're just on the beach when you're like, oh, I found something. I'm hanging on to this. If we can get it and possess it, I think it has broader impact than just in this room or just our families. Like, I think if, if the Huntsville campus gets this whole idea of grace and mercy, um, that entire city looks different. I think if the Mobile Bay campus r really rallies around this idea of, of grace and mercy, South Alabama looks completely different. Like, if we, if we get it here at, at the Grantsville campus all throughout Birmingham, we lean into this grace and mercy of the Father. Um, the, Jesus actually said, this is how that everybody else would know that you follow me because of the way you love each other. And can we just be honest, loving each other ain't always easy, y'all. Like, I think there may be people in this room right now and you're like, I'm gonna sit on this side because so-and-so's over there. I mean, we, we love Jesus. We got a little, you know, we got, can we bring grace and mercy back into the house of God and forgive freely, love deeply? Um, there's only way, one way to experience it though. And we're, we're, this is what I wanna get to in a second. Um, there's one way that you can have this in your life. Do you want it, yes or no? Yes. I, don't, I don't really believe you. Do, you. do you want this treasure of grace and mercy in your life? Yeah, yes or no? Yes. Okay, here, here's what it is. You have to keep experiencing it. 
Like every day, you have to go back and experience the mercy and grace of God all over again, every single day. Day. I love the tabernacle prayer. We're gonna, anybody excited for 21 days of prayer starting up on Sunday? Everybody love, love 21 days of prayer. Um, I, I love the, the, the ta- tabernacle prayer model of prayer. And it walks you through uh, just how you would have gotten to God in the Old Testament. So we enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts of praise. There's these stations. Stations remind us of the Holy Spirit, the cross, the blood of Christ. There's this labor where we get purified. Can you imagine? That's really what it was like to get in God's presence. The, the, you, there, was, there was all this work involved. But the ultimate goal was always the mercy seat. Every single time, the goal was mercy. It was get people to the mercy seat. The high priest, when he went inside to the Ark of the Covenant, he went to the mercy seat. Mercy was always the goal. If mercy's always been God's goal, why would we make it so difficult for everybody to get our mercy and grace? Because he did not make it hard for me. (laughs) He did not make it hard for me. I wanna show you a picture of of the Ark of the Covenant. We're gonna put it up on the screen. Um, Love this. Pastor Chris always points out that uh, if you watch Indiana Jones, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, they they do a great job. Uh, I, I don't know if this is where I got that or not, but they really do do a great job. This is where people would have gotten to, wanted to get to. And we would not have had access. The high priest, only the high priest would have had access. Very rarely could even go near the Ark of the Covenant. But when he went inside, you see the two angels on top of it, their eyes covered, focused down on the mercy seat. Um, The high priest would have taken blood and sprinkled it. Sacrificial blood sprinkled, sprinkled right on the mercy seat. Pastor Blake, come up here real quick. You guys get up for Pastor Blake. He's coming to the stage. I, I, I love the, the two angels, the seraphim. So they're, let's, let's be angels for a second. You look like a great angel. That's awesome. Okay, you're awesome. So these angels, wings blinding distractions. They're not paying attention to anything else. Staring down at the reflective top of the mercy seat, blood sprinkled on the mercy seat, would have only seen each other's reflection through the blood of Christ. We get into trouble, I get into trouble. Blake and I do a lot of life together. I can get mad at Blake. He can be annoying. He's happy all the time. It's, I don't wanna talk about Christmas right now. It's hot. Like, I, I, he does. We get into trouble. When we're gathered around the mercy of Christ, and we get our eyes up on each other. Because when I'm right here, Blake's got a problem. I'm not forgiving him. But if we'll get our head back down and look at the sacrifice that was made and see everybody around us through the the blood of Christ, we'll have a lot easier time giving mercy to the people around us. Blake makes a great angel. Give it up for Blake, everybody. Let me, let me give you some, um, some of the unearned gifts that we've been given through God's grace so we can really grab a hold of the treasure of mercy and grace. Um, hey, everybody, you've been given eternal life. I said you've been given eternal life, everybody. You've been adopted as the children of the Most High God. You've been made joint heirs with Christ. You've been given infinite riches in Christ. You've been given the power of God, the Holy Spirit to work in your life every single day, every single day. Some of you walked in tonight and you, there, there's, there's a sin that you're just like, I just can't seem to break free of this. I wanna remind you, you've been given the power, over, power and victory over sin. Um, you've been given the, the opportunity to conform everything in you like Christ. Your life life can be conformed to Christ. Here's a a, a grace gift. God hears your prayer. You're not talking to an empty sky. The God of the universe, when you seek him, like goes, oh, and leans down to listen to your prayer. What a gift.
you've got the gift of the fact that God will never, ever, 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 ever remove his love from you. What a gift. Um, and someday, here's the greatest gift. And someday, everybody that calls Christ their Lord, we're all gonna get to see his face and worship him in person. Like he'll be, he'll be in the room and we can celebrate with him. There's treasure in the house of the righteous. We gotta dig for it. We gotta look for it. There's the treasure of identity. There's the treasure of worship, not just singing, not just songs, the treasure of worship of God, you are bigger than everything. And I give my life to you. There's a treasure of grace and mercy. And here, here's the final treasure. Uh, everybody, prayer is a treasure. You have, the, you have the treasure of prayer at your disposal. As we go into 21 days of prayer, we go into the season of prayer, we're all going after God. What would happen if we all saw an opportunity to plead and intercede before God as a treasure, not just something, it's something we do this fall. This is not just something we do this fall. This is an opportunity to get before God and plead our case because He is listening. Samuel 12, 23 says this, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, 30. Hey everybody, one man can chase a thousand, but two can put 10,000 to flight. What happens when thousands put millions to flight? We get to put millions of demons on the run in the name of Jesus and say, you can't be here. You gotta go, you gotta go. Just stand up on your feet. Um, I know this is an interesting way to close out the service. I wanted to do prayer at the end of the service today. Uh, I don't wanna talk about it a whole lot. I actually wanted to give you a chance to respond and be, be prayed for or pray for somebody else because we see prayer as a treasure. I'm gonna invite the prayer teams at all of our campuses, go ahead and come down front and uh, worship teams, you guys can get ready. Um, we're gonna pray. Um, was thinking about the, the message today and actually had this thought, Man, what if somebody needs to be healed? I didn't talk about healing. What if somebody needs to be, um, needs a marriage restored? I, I didn't talk about marriage restoration and felt like the Holy Spirit said, please don't tie my power to a topic. Don't tie my power to a topic. If they'll just come to me and trust me, I'll step in, I'll do it. And so I wanna lead us in a prayer. And then um, campus is just a second. When I say amen, you guys take your services. And just a second, let's respond to God today. God, as we come to you, I'm so grateful for your word, Lord. We're grateful that there's treasure in the house of the righteous. God, but we're asking that we would see more of it, God. Would you give us the eyes to see what you see, the ears to hear what you hear? God, I'm praying for the person that walked in tonight struggling with their identity. Maybe their identity is wrapped up in the season of life they're in. God, their identity is in you. Would you help them? God, to be able to hold the treasure of the identity they have in you. God, I'm praying for the person who's made something else bigger than you. God, tonight, we wanna hold the treasure of worship. God, I'm praying for the person who's got some kind of, I don't know, man, just this, 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 this wall against somebody. God, would they be able to experience the mercy and grace that you offered them all over again? And God, all of us, God, we, we want to hold the treasure of prayer. Thank you so much for hearing our prayer. You said where two or more are gathered, God, you would, you would begin to work, you would do things. God, I'm praying for every single person, every single campus, as we respond to you, would you move in our lives? We ask it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Campuses, you can take your service.